total parenteral nutrition what is parenteral parenteral means outside the gut okay from outside the gut you are trying to feed the patient how is it possible hi friends let's discuss total parenteral nutrition now this is a common theory topic which can come for your exam so you might get a little bit bored but you have to you know take it as a part of the game so the key words used in this topic are refeeding syndrome immunonutrition and hickman lines first of all an introduction about tpn total parenteral nutrition what is parenteral enteral means through the gut parenteral means outside the gut okay from outside the gut you are trying to feed the patient basically you are only trying to get the nutrients reach the system of the patient you are not trying to feed the patient with food through a passage outside the gut but you are trying to make the uh, nutrients reach the system somehow so how can you use that nutrition through iv root only intravenous root only is called total parenteral nutrition total parenteral nutrition means nutrition is only through parenteral means okay uh, that is outside the gut only through intravenous root not through the gastrointestinal tract so look at this picture this picture actually shows you about the ways in which you can feed the patient the first is by spoon that is orally the second is what through the nose nasogastric tube or rice tube feeds through the nose you can bring the food to the git not only through oral route but also through uh, from the nose so nasogastric tube then you can put a tube into the stomach which is called feeding gastrostomy you can directly inject food into the stomach which is feeding gastrostomy you can inject it directly to the jejunum which is called feeding jejunostomy these are the techniques in which put in a different way maybe a bland diet etc or semi solid food can be uh, reached to the gut or the git but no, uh, all these things are not possible then what do you do the next option is to feed through intravenous route or total, uh, total parenteral nutrition okay so either you can feed the patient by putting a cannula into the subclavian artery reaching up to the supra vena uh, superior vena cava you can also use the same cannula by uh, in uh, by pricking on the internal jugular vein and reaching the superior vena cava so you will have nutrient rich fluid reaching the system of the patient that is that to the central system of the patient straight to the heart which is called the central tpn okay or you can use another vein like the vein of the hand or something and from the veins of the hand also you can inject nutrient related solutions into the system of the patient which is called the peripheral mode okay so either you can use a central catheter through subclavian or ijv uh, into the superior vena cava or you can use peripheral parenteral nutrition from the periphery you are um, from the indirectly reaching the uh, central system by injecting through a peripheral uh, cannula okay a ppn or peripheral parenteral nutrition through a peripherally inserted central venous catheter or through a for formal peripheral venous catheter so what is this this is when the catheter is inserted to a central vein which is a subclavian vein central vein means um, a vein which is not present in the extremity okay that is central venous catheter now this is a peripheral Le inserted central catheter. This is a long catheter. This is a long catheter which is inserted into a peripheral vein. This is probably the cephalic vein or the basilic vein. Okay, so a um, peripheral vein is cannulated, and the tip of the catheter or the cannula is reaching the central veins. Okay, so that is called peripherally inserted central vein. central catheter that can be used or a formal peripheral venous line or the tip of the cannula is reaching only the extremity or the periphery so different ways of doing a peripheral parenteral nutrition now what are the indications why do you need to actually do a total parenteral nutrition or through iv fluids through to, uh, by uh, putting a cannula inside the central vein or the peripheral vein why do you want to feed the patient why can't you give him food directly what are the conditions where you can't give him food directly it is either failure or contraindication of any uh, of any enteral nutrition for 7 to 10 days so feeding by mouth feeding 
through rice tube, feeding through gastrostomy or gerinostomy are all enteral nutrition. But you can't um, do that enteral nutrition for 7 to 10 days. To the first 7 to 10 days, if that is not possible, then you have to resort to total parenteral nutrition. High output abdominal fistulas, duodenal, biliary, pancreatic fistulas. Suppose you are giving food to this patient, but there is some leak and all this food is going out through some other fistulas etc then there is no point in feeding the patient basically that gut or the gastrointestinal tract is like having a leak so you have to avoid the git and resort to some other some other tract for nourishing the patient so that is one indication major abdominal surgeries of liver pancreas biliary colic or colonic so in these cases you have to keep the git under rest for some time. Septicemia or multiple trauma or short bowel syndrome. In all these conditions, what happens? The bowel is not healthy. Severe pancreatitis, bowel ischemia, uh, peritonitis, ileus, etc. Again, you have to give some rest to the gastrointestinal system. Massive GI bleeding, unstable hemodynamically. So sometimes if you feed the patient, it can increase the bleed. High risk of aspiration, Hyperemesis gravidarum, wherein you have to nourish the patient fast. The enteric nutrition is not, enteral nutrition is not enough. Multi-organ failure, head injury, severe burns, all these conditions, patient may not be in a position to undergo any kind of enteral nutrition. So what are the techniques? One is of course the central venous line. Here, using a needle and guide wire, a subclavian vein or IJV or EJV. Uh, Internal jugular vein or external jugular vein catheter is passed just below the clavicle and fixed securely to the skin. This is how it is done. See, this is the catheter which is passed. You have the rib over here. First, you have to prick on the prick beneath the clavicle to reach the subclavian vein. You have to aspirate some uh, blood and make sure that it is the vein and not the artery. Then into that needle, you are going to put a guide wire. That guide wire will reach the subclavian vein up to maybe up to uh, superior vena cava once the guide wire is going smoothly you have to dilate that tract by putting a dilator take out the dilator then thread the catheter into this guide wire you have to thread the catheter into this guide wire and then you can very well remove this guide wire and you now whatever you inject into this uh, catheter will go straight into the superior vena cava. So that is how it is done. Disadvantage is position in the neck. There is a cannula in the neck. Now that is very difficult for the patient. It can displace, it can move here and there, dislodge. And sometimes this is, of course, this, is, this place is where there is a lungs, right? So it can injure the pleura and it can lead to pneumothorax. So uh, advantage is that it can be used for a long time because it's a central vein. It can be used for a long time. There is, uh, it will take time for thrombophlebitis to develop, unlike the peripheral vein. Now, what are Hickman lines? Hickman lines have a cuff at the exit side to reduce the dislodgement. Here you can see that there is a cuff over here, which is to um, keep that catheter in place so that it won't dislodge. Multi-lumen catheters may be used, but one port for one infusion. So these central line catheters, you can't use it everywhere, right? Because there are only one or two sites where it can be used. Unlike peripheral lines, you can put so many cannulas on your arms and legs, right? So uh, instead of putting many catheters for central line, you can just do it in one prick, but there can be more than one ports. So one port can be used for one infusion. Now coming to peripheral line. Peripheral line can be peripherally inserted, central catheter we have already seen, or usual IV cannula. So these are the usual IV cannulas. Uh, here you can see green color. Green is, uh, you're getting the green signal for a driving license. So that's how I remember it, 18 gauge. 18 years is the age when you get a uh, driving license. Then gray is 16. When you're 16 years old, you're not sure whether you're an adult or a, you're an adult or a child. So you're not sure whether you're black or white. So it is gray. So 16 gauge. Then uh, 22 is for the blue one. Okay. 
It can be a peripherally inserted central line as we have already seen earlier. A long catheter which is inserted peripherally but will reach the central veins. PICC or peripherally inserted central lines, the advantage is that you can keep up to 7 days. Okay, But if thrombophlebitis occurs, the whole vein is getting damaged. So this is a picture of peripherally inserted central line. If there is infection or thrombophlebitis which occurs, it will affect the whole vein from the cephalic or the break, uh, basilic vein up to the superior vena cava. Okay, but you can use it for seven to uh, seven days. So before seven days, you will have to remove it. Ordinary cannula, you have to recite it every twelve hours to avoid thrombophlebitis. After twelve hours, there is chance of thrombophlebitis to occur in an ordinary. IV cannula, peripheral cannula. Advantage of peripheral line is that there is no pneumothorax or hemothorax unlike uh, central lines. No thoracic duct or artery or ca uh, cardiac perforation. Disadvantage is of course the thrombophlebitis. So this is a picture of um, the peripheral line, per peripheral venous thrombos uh, thrombophlebitis cycle or the PVT cycle. First you insert a new cannula. Then what happens? That is endothelial damage. Okay, this is a cannula which is inserted. That time there is an endothelial damage over here, wherever you have inserted. That will lead to venous constriction. See, the vessel has been constricted. Then drug or infusion is administered. So when the drug is administered, sometimes that can cause further constriction of the vessel. Inflammatory and vasoactive mediators become active over here. Then inflammation or thrombosis finally blood will get clot over here or thrombosis occurs when there is thrombus formation or venous occlusion what will happen there is extra vestation or pain and then the cannula is removed you remove the finally you decide to remove the cannula again you insert it in a different place and again there is this cycle continues now what are the goals of pa total parental nutrition Why, how uh, how much you have to give up uh, parental nutrition how will you decide how much you have to give it uh, or how less you have to give it to decrease the, ad uh, the goal is to decrease adverse effects of catabolism now already you have seen the indications all these indications will lead to catabolism of the uh, body system so to avoid it you are giving total parental nutrition to increase protein synthesis to reduce protein breakdown and to prevent weight loss then to support ongoing metabolism whatever anabolism is going on let to support it you have to need an extra um, extra help and for that you're giving uh, parental nutrition other than the enteral nutrition maybe you have to supplement total parental nutrition to improve immune function cardiac and respiratory function sometimes the nutrition other kinds of nutrition may not be sufficient to maintain glycogen reserve in cardiac and respiratory muscles. Now again, as response to injury, glycogen might uh, come down as part of starvation, etc. So you have to promptly replace it in order to avoid any cardiac or respiratory problems. For that, you need TPN. To maintain acid-based electrolyte metabolism because uh, through other food items, etc., you may not be able to control the absorption and the content of the electrolytes, uh, etc. So, you will have to use TPN. Age, pre morbid state, muscle mass, weight, serum albumin should be assessed in order to find out how much and how long you have to give TPN. Underlying disease with severity, therapies for the disease, GI function should be assessed. All the after uh, um, making sure that the patient is well enough uh, i mean well enough to uh, undergo total parental nutrition you decide on what to give when to give how much to give right depending on the severities and what all therapies he or she is getting fluid requirement how to assess the fluid requirement if you give excess fluid also it is going to be a problem for the heart of the patient so it is assessed by 1500 ml for first 20 kg then 20 ml per kg for additional weight over 24 hours okay that is how much fluid you have to give 1500 for 20 kg so 60 kg means what 20 ml per kg after 20 so 20 into 20 another 400 so 1500 plus 400 1900 for 60 kg right energy needed how is how is it calculated by calculating resting energy expenditure or REE REE in kilocalories per day is 25 into weight in kg. That much calories should be needed. Resting energy expenditure. Even at rest, some amount of energy is utilized by the patient. That is called REE. That is the basic amount of energy which the patient needs to survive. And that is 25 into weight. 
okay so for 60 kg patient how much is the um, energy needed 25 into 60 is 150 zero the, at least 1500 kilocalories per day is needed for the patient to survive if he is 60 kg what are the components of tpn so you know that we have to give some nutrition uh, through the iv route but what nutrition what are you supposed to give through iv route you can give all the possible things which you have to give through food like carbohydrates at the rate of dextrose 55 mg per kg per minute because one gram of dextrose will give 3.4 kilocalories okay uh, 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 you can give it at, at a concentration of 50 to 70 percent okay the problems with this is that low calorie value uh, carbohydrates if you are giving only dextrose the problem is that it has a low calorie value requires large fluid volume to infuse so when the concentration is less when there is only uh, one gram is only giving 3.4 kilocalories imagine how much grams should be given to reach 1500 okay so that will uh, the uh, the amount of grams is equal to the amount of fluid okay so fluid uh, volume may be required I mean, might be high if you're sticking only to carbohydrates it can lead to hyperglycemia causes more carbon dioxide produ uh, production and lead on to thrombophlebitis if you're giving carbohydrates or dextrose through the peripheral vein so we can switch on to the next thing which is fat fat gives more energy one gram will produce about nine kilocalories essential fatty acids can also be given as emulsion containing long chain triglycerides advantages high calories there prevents hyperglycemia glucose and nitrogen sparing so it's good less carbon dioxide production less insulin production uh, because it's not carbohydrate it prevents essential fatty acid deficiency also which is uh, definitely going to be the inevitable reduces thrombophlebitis also but the problem with the fat um, uh, fat total parental nutrition is that it can lead to excessive fat hypertriglyceridemia sepsis can occur fat embolism can occur fat overload hepatic dysfunction pancreatitis delayed gastric emptying triglyceride so triglyceride value should be monitored weekly okay to avoid hypertriglyceridemia if it is more than 400 milligram percentage infusion should be discontinued okay so that is a problem with fat now coming to the other part carbo after carbohydrate after fat the next thing is amino acids amino acids the calorie value is 4 kilo calories per gram 6.25 gram protein has 1 gram of nitrogen so that is 20 percent of the energy in uh, parental nutrition daily protein need is 0.8 to 1.5 gram per kg okay so you have to give uh, point uh, about one gram per kg that is about 60 grams per kg for a 60 kg patient okay the problem with amino acid uh, metabolism is that it should be less in patients with chronic renal failure or hepatic encephalopathy and it should be more in patients with burns trauma enteropathy and sepsis protein supplement should not increase i mean exceed 1.7 gram per kg per day if so, it will lead to urea, excess of uh, urea production. So proper monitoring by bun or ammonia level is essential. So you now know that whether it's carbohydrates, fats or proteins, there are advantages as well as disadvantages. Other than that, of course, there are vitamins, electrolytes, trace elements and minerals. The important ones are sodium, potassium, magnesium, phosphate, calcium and for fat soluble vitamins, which uh, are essential vitamins like A, D, E, K water soluble vitamins trace elements like chromium copper iodine iron manganese selenium zinc all these are used in parental nutrition because all these elements are definitely important for the um, recovery and uh, health of the good health of the patient so you know that carbohydrates fats proteins vitamins minerals everything can be given through pro total parental nutrition and all of them have its own uh, advantages as, as, as well as disadvantages so you need a proper cocktail to get an optimum response and so you have certain certain preparations like the cabivan preparation this is the cabivan preparation uh, all the ingredients etc are mentioned in this and patient will get about uh, 1440 kilocalories per day if one whole fluid is given to the patient so it is like see there are different compartments one for carbohydrate then you have for lipids and for amino acids vitamins minerals and each of them are broken uh, I mean, uh, just before infusing, the, all these compartments are uh, coilies together and together they give it as a cocktail. 
what are the complications of parental nutrition related to nutrient deficiency because of uh, reduced reduced nutrients reaching the system because it is a um, parental thing and not an enteral thing what are the problems can lead to hypoglycemia hypocalcemia hypophosphatemia hypomagnesemia okay, which is called defeating syndrome we'll come to it chronic deficiency syndromes like essential fatty acids may not be given through parental nutrition zinc mineral and trace elements can may be ignored all those are the deficiency problems related to overfeeding what happens if you are giving uh, decreased amounts of total parental nutrition these are the problems if you are giving excess what will happen hyperglycemia hyperosmolar dehydration hepatic steatosis hypercapnia sympathetic activity fluid retention electrolyte abnormalities in case of excess glucose if you are giving excess fat corresponding to that you will have hypercholesterolemia formation of lipoprotein x hypertriglyceridemia hypersensitivity reactions etc if you are giving excess of amino acids what will happen again hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis hypercalcemia amino acidemia and finally uremia so excess is also problem uh, deficiency is also a problem related to sepsis what all can happen catheter related sepsis because of the catheter patient can undergo sepsis possible increased predisposition to systemic sepsis is also there related to line while inserting the line if it is a central line patient can have pneumothorax uh, damage to adjacent artery or air embolism thoracic duct can be damaged cardiac perforation or tamponade can occur pleural effusion can occur hydromediastinum all these the but you have tried uh, to insert a line with good intention but it can backfire on long term use the catheter can undergo occlusion as well as venous thrombosis so what is refeeding syndrome this is a shift a, a major shift in the electrolyte and fluid uh, mechanisms or fluid uh, content of the body due to uh, uh, due to feeding through parental nutrition or to yeah through parental nutrition so there is occurrence of severe fluid and electrolyte imbalance in severely malnourished individual while starting the proper feeding enteral or parental nutrition so suddenly if you are switching over the um, feeding mechanisms maybe from total parental nutrition to enteral nutrition or from starvation to total parental nutrition etc there is major shift occurring in the fluid and electrolyte balance okay it is like getting the rain in a desert suddenly the desert won't be able to adapt and that can lead to problems like certain things can be adapted certain things can be adjusted others cannot be adjusted it will backfire like hypomagnesemia hypocalcemia and hypophosphatemia can occur leading to myocardial dysfunction respiratory changes altered liver functions altered level of consciousness and convulsions and finally death because the electrolyte milieu has undergone an imbalance gradual feeding and correction of magnesium phosphate and calcium and other electrolytes is important because otherwise it can lead to hypomagnesemia hypocalcemia etc okay sudden decrease because of the delay in absorption etc can happen due to refeeding syndrome Cond the condition is common in chronic starvation severe anorexia alcoholic patients etc so suddenly when lot of food or nutrients reach in the system sudden absorption cannot occur and adaptation has also stopped and finally it lead to sudden undesirable problems like the refeeding syndrome now coming to a short note on immunonutrition just to understand what is immunonutrition in case it asked, is asked as a short note there are certain things which are given uh, priority while uh, while uh, nourishing the patient like arginine arginine supports t cells and is a substrate for nitrous oxide okay so arginine is, is important in, in while including in the nutrition program omega 3 um polyunsaturated fatty acids they are important because they can increase prostaglandins decrease arachidonic acid eicosanoids that is pro inflammatory mediators can be decreased increased epa or eicosapentaenoic acid eicosanoids and dha docosahexaenoic acid docosanoids which are anti inflammatory so they decrease inflammatory mediators and increase anti inflammatory mediators then modulate trans uh, transcription factors etc so they play a vital role in general improvement of the patient so it should be included in while giving nutrition also nucleotides non specifically they increase immune competence so they are also important in including in the uh, nutrition 
program. They are recommended seven days before to seven days after surgery, which will give good results because after nourishing the patient, you're taking the patient for surgery. Even um, then, you can help the patient in adjusting the post-op changes in body composition, etc. Major neck surgery, malnourished, uh, so, uh, malnourished people, onco, um, oncological gastrointestinal surgery, trauma of more than two systems, mild sepsis, ARDS, etc. All these are the people who will. Uh, maximally uh, get benefited uh, by using these kind of immunonutrition specific nutrients. So questions you can get short notes on total parental nutrition, refeeding syndrome as well as uh, enhanced recovery after surgery because uh, in enhanced recovery after surgery you may need to use total parental nutrition and immunonutrition etc. MCQ number one pro-inflammatory mediators are TNF alpha, IL1, IL6, IL8 all of these are the pro-inflammatory mediators. Re refeeding syndrome is characterized by hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia, actually all of these. MCQ number 3. Immunonutrition includes supplementation of arginine, omega-3 fatty acids and nucleotides. So all of these is the answer. So we have completed this session. Until we meet next time with another topic. Bye-bye.